Hello, my name is Andrea Barnwell Brownlee, and I am the director of the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art. Today is my great privilege to welcome you all to an intimate conversation between Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and artist Carrie Mae Weems. Welcome. Good morning, Mayor Bottoms. It's so wonderful to see you. Good morning, it's great to see you as well. And thank you uh, just for, for having us. Thank you for being able to, to take the time. I know how busy you are, not only with what's going on in your city, but of course with this extraordinary election that we have going on that's about to happen in 29 days, 28 days, one of the most historic in our lifetimes. And then we have to deal with this uh, unprecedented uh, pandemic that is shaking us to our core. Yeah, you know, it's so hard to believe that we're this close to the election. And this has been an extraordinary year in so many ways. And who, who knows what else is in store. But my hope is that in November, we'll all be talking about the record turnout. And uh, hopefully my favorite candidate will win. <laughs> I'm with you on I'm with you on that. You know, it's 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 been sort of extraordinary. You, um, like any number of uh, of of uh, citizens, uh, not only uh, in uh, the United States but around the world, have been impacted by COVID nineteen personally. Uh, you've had COVID nineteen. You've had to battle this disease yourself. Uh, you, along with uh, I believe several other members of your family, and so you know what this pandemic means uh, on, a, on an even deeper level because you've had to, to deal with this. I was, you know, just absolutely struck uh, by your uh, rapid response to, uh, to COVID-19, to the pandemic, and to your, uh, your swift move in actually closing down the city of Atlanta um, when when so many other cities were still uh, trying to figure out how to move forward. What gave you that sort of insight, that understanding to, to, to realize and know that you needed to move quickly and decisively in closing and locking down the city to prevent the spread of the pandemic? Well, you know, uh, as my mother often reminds me, a little bit of common sense goes a very long way. And it was very clear to us in Atlanta, the path that we were about to go down. At that point, we were looking at what was happening outside of the United States, uh, particularly in Italy, I believe at that time was the hot spot. And I have a quarterly meeting with CEOs in Atlanta at that meeting, Dr. Carlos Del Rio uh, from Emory University, one of the leading infectious disease experts in the country, made a presentation to us that it was, and I mentioned that I was with these CEOs because this is an important part of the decision-making. Uh, he told us that it was not a matter of if, but when we were hit with COVID and that we would be facing the same things that we were seeing at that time on television from Italy. And it was just a matter of days and that we needed to shut the city down immediately. It made my job so much easier because I was sitting there with CEO of the Fortune 500 companies uh, who made the decision, got the same information I made, made the decision simultaneously to shut down many of our large job centers in the city and I, I truly believe it's why for as bad as our numbers have been in Georgia, our fate was not even worse. And then of course, having the benefit of watching what happened uh, or what's happening in New York, um, anyone with any conscience and understanding of basic science, I, I would hope would make the same decisions that we made in the city, but clearly that, didn't, uh, that hadn't been applicable to everyone, but um, I just did not want our fate to be the same as what we were watching on television. You know, the numbers amongst African American, Native Americans, Latino Americans have been staggering, right? You know, we know that, you know, for instance, um, you know, some of the first numbers that, that, that we, we had indicated uh, that um, in the city of Atlanta, for instance, um, 
80% of the deaths were amongst people of color, amongst black people, Latinos in particular. Yeah, it's 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 um, it's it's mind boggling, and I can tell you um, very early on in a pandemic, when our numbers, our reported numbers, were still very low in Georgia. What struck me is that I knew so many people who were being impacted by COVID at that time, and I could not reconcile that if our numbers at that time were showing less than a thousand people infected, that I knew so many people personally, or or you know, one person removed from people who were sick and who were dying. Um, and that's been borne out that it's because our communities were getting hit harder. And even though the spread in the African-American community is now not as high as it is um, with our brown brothers and sisters, uh, we are still dying at a much higher rate in Georgia. Um, and it, again, just speaks to how deadly this virus is in terms of communities that are already facing many challenges with underlying health conditions. But the reality is this, in the South, especially, just about everybody has some underlying health condition, whether it's obesity, whether it's high blood pressure, pressure, whether it's asthma, heart disease. Uh, unfortunately, these underlying conditions are prevalent and even more so in our black and brown communities. And that's what the numbers reflect. And so in your own circumstance, um, you um, contacted COVID-19. And I'm so happy that you made it through that. Um, tell us about that experience. What was it like for you? Do, do you have any a sense of, of, of how you were infected, when you were, when you were infected uh, with COVID? Mm -hmm. Well, I can I can pretty much narrow it down to within the week. And it's because of poor testing in Georgia. I was getting tested regularly, um, especially when I was around big crowds. It was in the midst of the protest and I had been to a very large funeral. And just as a matter of course, I, I had myself tested and had my family members tested. We didn't get those test results back. Um, one, almost a week later, my husband was sleeping a lot, which was very unusual. So at some point I decided to get us all tested again. Uh, those results still weren't back. When we got those test results back, my husband was positive, I was positive, and my son was positive. And what's noteworthy about that, the previous week, my son was positive. He was asymptomatic. My husband and I were negative. So had we received those test results back within 24, 48 hours, as we should have, then we could have quarantined my son and certainly taken other precautions. But uh, th this has been the challenge with testing, contact tracing, all of those things that we know um, continues to make the, our response to COVID less than optimal in this country. Um, but Thankfully, I was asymptomatic. Uh, my son was asymptomatic. My husband was very, very sick and continues to have the after effects of COVID. I guess he would be classified as a long hauler. He wakes up with very bad headaches, migraine headaches, uh, unexpected onset of fatigue. And, you know, it's just this reminder that even someone like my husband who goes in perfectly healthy, uh, can still be stricken by this disease. And and I'll just, you know, something, I'll share something. I, I thought it was an interesting observation, even watching President Trump go out and take a ride and, and then return to the White House. And, and yeah. people seem to think that that's somehow a reflection of how well he's doing. It's not. Uh, I like to see what happens after he gets through the door. And I say that because there were days when my husband would think he felt better, he would walk to the mailbox and then have to come in and sleep for three hours. So, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, you know. which is the reality. I mean, I think that, you know, the thing that, that you know, this is, you know, calling uh, 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 me to really uh, think about uh, is really has been the role of governors and the federal government in its lack of response 
to states in, in, in establishing a mandate for the nation in terms of safety and that the president himself is deeply culpable and has really been the source of a great deal of anxiety and really the cause of you know over 200,000 people losing their lives and that he would leave um, Walter Reed yesterday, come home to the, to the White House, uh, present himself as this sort of the commander in chief, rip off a mask and say, don't be afraid of COVID, as though, as though somehow it is defeatable through personal triumph is, is a, a mockery of and an insult to those who have lost their lives, an insult to Americans generally, and, uh, and an affront to the world in, in, internationally. I mean, this has been one of the most extraordinary displays of, of, of foolishness and, and ignorance that's imaginable. And, um, and in the wake of that, um, we have these strong numbers. Over 7 million people are now infected with this virus. We don't know actually what it's going to mean uh, going down the road. As you said, your husband is experiencing these long-term effects of this, even though he is technically asymptomatic, asymptomatic at this point. Am I right about that? Yeah, you're right. And, um, you know, my, my husband chastises me. Uh, he said, you know, look, people died. I, I'm, I'm fine. Um, and, and if that's our standard that you didn't die, then we're all in big trouble. And what I, you know, r remind my husband of, yeah, people died, but that shouldn't be our baseline of, of how you're doing. You're, you're still dealing with this. And, yeah. It is so unfortunate that our elected officials aren't taking this seriously. We elect people to lead us and make sound decisions and make decisions about public health and to share information and validate information that the general public may not have access to. But this is uncharted territory for us as a country, but I would say it's not uncharted territory for the world. We've seen dictators rise before. And we've seen it happen when p people of good conscience don't speak up and push back. So, you know, I know that we can talk for a very long time about, <coughs> excuse me, elections and, and consequences of elections, but this is it front and center. What do you think, you know, I mean, you know, what has been, uh, as you move forward in Atlanta, I mean, we're, you know, thrilled to have our, our, our COVID-19 project there, uh, sort of aiding uh, w wherever we can in, uh, uh, in sort of a common knowledge of safety, of maintaining distance, of the importance of all of the social protocols that can keep us safe moving, moving forward. Um, at this moment uh, in Atlanta, what is the impact of the lockdown? What do you see coming down the pike? And certainly as we move towards the election that's going to happen in just a short, in a, in a short you know, 20, 29, 28 or 29 days, you know, how, how do we prepare the, the citizens of Atlanta uh, to participate in the voting process? So in the city of Atlanta, we are as a, an organization not responsible for elections that rests with our county and with our secretary of state's office. But we certainly recognize that we can't advocate our responsibility and duty to make sure that our citizens don't have um, everything they need to exercise their right to vote. So there are several things that have been done in the city of Atlanta, including the opening of State Farm Arena, which is owned by the city of Atlanta, uh, but run and really operated by <clears throat> our Recreation Authority and also the Atlanta Hawks. They've opened up State Farm Arena for early voting. I voted there this summer. It was a great experience, gives people the ability to vote safely and to properly distance. Uh, but we've also taken it a step further in conjunction with Michelle Obama's organization, When We All Vote. We are giving city employees 
four hours off between early voting and election and on election day to actually go and vote. They can take paid leave to do oh, that. Wonderful. That's great. Yeah, well, thank you. And then eight hours off if they would like to volunteer um, as a poll worker, because part of what we've seen, we had many of our, our senior um, residents who are wonderful poll workers, but certainly with what all we've talked about with COVID, and we know that age is a, can put you at even greater risk. Um, many of the seniors aren't able to go and work the polls as they normally do. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we keep them safe. So we're saying to our employees, if you would like to go and work at a poll, volunteer to work at a poll, please get the training you need, do it, and we'll give you paid time off to do that as well. Did you have a sense in coming into this office of what it would mean to be in government at this sort of extraordinary period? I had no idea. And, <laughs> uh, you know, there, there are days I feel like I'm the, I'm the puppy who caught the school bus and uh, now I go, you know, what do I do with this? And so much of that has to do with just where we are as a country. There was no way that anybody I, I, I think could, well, let me take that back. I, I think there are, are those who are very informed who anticipated that we could face a pandemic at some point. I just didn't know that it would be in 2020. And on top of that, the social justice movement that's happening across the country. So my tenure has, has not been at all what I expected. But, uh, you know, again, uh, leaders lead and you don't get to always script those things that you will lead on. But you you are required to rise to the occasion. And okay. my hope that I've, I've done that as mayor of Atlanta. I just wish that there were other people across our country who had the same ability. What do you think you've learned from this, this period? What do you know now about yourself that you did not know before? Um, and not just over the past few months, but really um, this has been an evolution of just being um, a leader in the spotlight, um, that my my intuition never fails me. And there are so many times in life, um, especially as a woman, uh, that you have feelings about things and you dismiss it or ignore it or, or, or don't place value on it. Uh, but I've learned that when I pay attention to the facts, and then couple that with, with what I feel in my gut. Um, I can't think of an occasion that I've been wrong. And I have to remind myself that, you know, intuition is a, is a secret weapon, that facts are important. You should always look at the facts, uh, but don't ever dismiss what I think is, is that other God given um, talent, ability um, that gives you insight that you just can't always put your finger on. You know, it's, it's sort of amazing to see this sort of rise in uh, uh, social justice around the country, coupled with this pandemic, things that you've just sort of spoken to so eloquently. I wonder, what does, what does equity look like? from your vantage point as mayor of one of the most dynamic cities in the country. What is equity now? And how do we bring that uh, into our lives and into our government, into the process, into the, 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 the electoral process? I believe that equity is begins with an articulation that all things are not equal. And from my vantage point as mayor, it's about making sure that people have the tools to access so that they can succeed. It doesn't mean that everybody is going to succeed. It doesn't mean that everybody is going to access and tap into those resources. But it does mean that as a city, as, as a government, we have a responsibility to make sure that people have the ability to get what they need when and if they need it and want it. And it's really interesting when I think about equity, we talk about equity a lot and it 
you know, will probably be one of those buzzwords of the year. Right. Um, but I often wonder when my mother is sitting at her bridge club meeting on Saturday, if I say something about equity, what will they know what that means? Uh, so I try and think of it. You ask, what does it mean? It means that it that people that it means something to people. Meaning, I'll give you an example. Um, we have a lot of conversations about uh, making sure um, that that you know we're conscious about the climate and et cetera. All things that are very important. But if I'm talking to my mother's bridge club meeting, they're going to want want to know well how much is my power bill each month. So if I speak it in terms of how it impacts their day to day, or or you know my my grandchildren aren't still having to go to the hospital because of their asthma. If I talk about how it impacts people on a day to day basis, then it resonates and and it means something in our communities. But if we just talk about it as this high level, complicated mm -hmm. concept. It doesn't mean anything. A question. It, it's, 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 it's like too abstract. It's too abstract, right? It doesn't. Abstract. It's not specific enough. I had a professor at FAMU, Dr. Hawkins, who would often say to us, "I was a journalism major." He said, "When you're writing, if Joe on the back of the Coca-Cola truck can't understand it, it's too complicated." And <laughs> That's exactly what I think about equity and what it means. If we don't understand it, it's too complicated. But what it means is that people have a fair shot. They have access to tools and resources and that their lives are better. Uh, but when things are, are not always equal, uh, there's an opportunity for us to even the playing field. So then let me, let me ask you this, because this is important to me. You know, I can't, I can't imagine being in your, your, your position. I can't imagine running a city. I can barely run my studio, right? I mean, you know, I, I find it so, so, some days just so completely overwhelming, you know? And I couldn't run your studio. <laughs> Let, let's make that clear. <laughs> You know, and there's yet, you know, so much that we feel, so much that we want to do, so much that we want to see for all people, you know, for all humanity, you know, and I, and, and I, but I do wonder what is, what is, um, what is possible um, when we um, have to also negotiate these very complicated uh, uh, roads of power that are constantly attempting to disenfranchise, for instance, voters, right? Like on the like on the most basic level, right? You know, I wonder, you know, what what is it that you know that the, that, the, that there are these sort of governmental powers and these structures that seem to sort of stand in the way of our ability to really progress forward, right? So that we know that, you know, we know the impacts of sort of systematic racism. We know the, we, we know the impact of what this is meant for, for, for black families, for black women, for what, what it means for us to be uh, impacted more by this pandemic than anybody else, right? You know, that these are, that this is the, the, the outcome of the lack of social justice, right? And equity. And at, the, and at the same time, right, in the face of a government that denies us access to access systematically, how do you confront that as mayor? Well, you know- How do you grapple with this? I'll, I'll tell you, uh, Carrie Mae, so much of it just has to do with, with being authentic and bringing who we are to the table. Mm -hmm. So in the same way that that art reflects, I'm right here. I'm just I have to plug in my computer. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll um, forgive me. Talk about being authentic. Yeah, my, pop, my power cord popped off. Sorry about that. Life in the <laughs> pandemic. Um, but in in the same way that art reflects life, our policy should reflect the wants and needs of our communities. And I'll just I'll go back to the 
pandemic. Um, a lot of the policies we started paying for from the city had nothing more to do with my sitting down, thinking through, and our team thinking through what people might need. So we suspended water bills. Uh, we suspended towing in right of way. We called upon our, our partners, um, uh, our housing authority, and some of our other partners to suspend evictions. We right. created a, a strength and beauty fund for, for hairstylists and barbers to get a thousand dollar grant because we knew they wouldn't be working. We did a, a create TL fund for our, our artists and, and our musicians. And I, and the list goes on. There was no blueprint for that. That was just thinking through what do people need and how do we respond? And that's really what our policies should be each and every day. Um, our biggest challenge right now as a city is now getting out of the COVID response mode because this is our now normal and we'll be here for a minute. But now making sure that we're still taking care of the people's business and proactively thinking about the needs of our communities outside of COVID. And that's a huge challenge for us right now because COVID has sucked up all of our energy over the past few months. And I know that's happening to people across the country, but we just tried to make sure that we done our part to make it easier for people to navigate this unprecedented time that we're in. It is really rather extraordinary. I'm wondering, you know, as we sort of move forward, you know, we're moving into like the, the fall, into the winter, into flu season, um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm in here in New York. I'm in Brooklyn right now. Uh, Mayor De Blasio last night, you know, started talking about, or yesterday started talking about closing down certain schools again, closing down certain bars and restaurants in very particular neighborhoods where uh, COVID seems to be spiking and on the rise. How do you deal with this in in Atlanta and what's going on? Do you have any sense of of how you're preparing for? Or rather, I should say, how are you preparing for uh, the coming fall and the coming flu season? And and are you are you uh, uh, considering the possibility of having to lock down again in any sort of substantial way? So this is uh, where the governor and I have disagreed very publicly, and we created an advisory task force in Atlanta to give us recommendations on how we should reopen in the city of Atlanta, and then through a series of executive actions, the governor, uh, you know, signed some things that uh, made our policies moot in some ways. So their, re their recommendations. And then, of course, he sued me personally over the mask mandate. Um, but the reality is in the city of Atlanta, we're still only in phase two with our advisory recommendations. So things should not uh, be completely open in the city. People have the right and the ability to do that, um, but I truly believe that in in pushing back against the governor on the mask mandate, and now having leaders across our state being able to mandate masks, it's the reason our numbers are have been trending downward in the state of Georgia. So it is our hope, my understanding, and talking with our public health officials, that flu season maybe won't be as bad because people are wearing masks and if they're taking a lot of the precautions associated with COVID, that will help lessen flu season. But we're certain we're, we're bracing ourselves on the front end, again, in, in making decisions um, on, on how we anticipate. Uh, we, our, our, our public safety workers, our sanitation workers, et cetera, we started giving them hazard pay $500 a month, we were one of the first cities to do that, to ensure that they were continuing to show up for work. Well, we know as we get into uh, fall and flu season, you know, we, we got to face the fact that we may have a number of people out with flu, a number of people out with COVID. We are anticipating that and just trying to make sure that we can continue to incentivize healthy people to show up to work and, and also, uh, just reminding people 
that we aren't where we should be anyway as a city. And that's the reason we're still in phase two. So if people are following our guidelines, they wouldn't be out and about doing many of the things that they are currently doing. Do you have a sense, you know, I mean, you know, one of the things that we try to do with our, our um, COVID project, of course, was, you know, following your lead and Mayor Lightfoot, her lead, you know, she was, you know, I think the, the two of you were the, the two first mayors who really stepped out uh, in a bold way uh, uh, along with, uh, you know, with New York to really uh, uh, consider what was going on with this 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 virus and, and the importance of of a heightened awareness, a heightened awareness. Um, is there anything that that um, that you need us to do, artists to do, to assist further, to assist you further, to assist you know not only you know uh, uh, the city of Atlanta. You know, but but the country further in broadening uh, uh, public awareness about the necessity of maintaining levels of safety and safety protocols. Is there anything at all that you can think of that you might want us to be involved in as artists to help with uh, uh, this um, with our campaign, with our campaign? Well, thank you for asking that. And I'll add uh, Mayor London Bree to that list as well. So I've said um, over the course of the past several months that leadership is as much about following. It doesn't mean we, we think of as much as we possibly can, but we don't know it all. So what I would ask of our artistic community is if there are things that we need to lead better on, if there are ideas that you have that can help the messaging resonate better, that can help us help relieve some of the anxiety and stress um, within our respective communities, by all means, pass it along to us. Um, Mayor Breed did her, her shutdown order, I almost lifted it verbatim. Mayor Woodfin in Birmingham created Birmingham Strong, which we lifted for ATL Strong. And part of that is how we ended up with our CreateTL fund to, to help our gig industry that I talked about. So if there are things that are happening across the country that we aren't doing and we can do better, by all means, don't assume that your elected officials know it all. We don't know it all, um, but elevate it to us. But right now, a couple of very important things in the midst of all this craziness, don't forget to fill out your census form. There's been an enormous push to, to not count our communities, especially our urban communities, Please fill out your census form. It's very simple, easy to do. And I, I thought I had the website right in front of me. I believe it's 2020census.gov. You can Google it. Um, and also, of course, uh, vote. Um, and yes, then on top of that, continue to use your network to, to push out truth because there's so much misinformation that's being pushed out. And uh, people often receive information so much better when it's, it's presented um, in appealing artistic forms. And, uh, you know, we're, we're government folk. Our, our messaging looks like government. It often sounds like government. Uh, but any, any spin that you can put on it to, to make it more appealing to people, more attractive to people, uh, to resonate with people, Please do that. And again, just please, if there are policies and things that we can do better and we can put forth, please let us know. You know, this has been, um, um, we've, um, one of the things that I think that we've done very well in the project that we've brought to both Atlanta, Savannah, Chicago, um, California, Texas, um, we've done great jobs, Detroit, you know, this hour with this COVID fake six, right? The, um, you know, the amount of distance uh, necessary for social distancing uh, has been a, a very, very important project. And one of the things that we, we try to do, that I try to do along with my very dear friend, Pierre Loving, who, who, um, who really helped me to develop our proposal, um, is that I knew that we wanted to try to be in as many uh, spaces as possible. So that um, how do we bring information into the home? 
Well, we have billboards, we have posters, we could use the back of buses. Um, we could we could print information on uh, recyclable, reusable grocery bags, information, first of all, thanking all of the frontline workers mm -hmm. who've been there, making sure that, you know, that, that, that we're eating and, and being able to move around the city and have our trash picked up, et cetera, right? You know, thanking the frontline workers, but also constantly reminding people of the safety protocols. And so we printed them on all kinds of surfaces. We would deliver grocery bags, for instance, to food pantries, right? Delivering thousands of bags to food pantries so that people were taking home, carrying the message with them constantly, right? And magnets and hats and bags and t-shirts and hats and so forth, right? Uh, just, you know, just making sure that we were constantly advocating uh, for public awareness and doing so, I think, in a way that was really sort of beautiful, right? Um, um, I, I included a, an image of my, my, my mother, who is a factory worker, uh, saying, life is beautiful. So be sure to stay home if you can, wash up and mask up and back up. Right. You know, just, uh, you know, these sort of ideas. We would love to see this project expanded. We want to make sure that, you know, that it's here. And it, it, of course, in Atlanta right now, um, I'm going to make sure that you have a packet of all of our information so that you can also sort of share that with some of your colleagues as well who are trying to deal with this, I think, effectively um, uh, in a direct and unmitigated way that comes absolutely out of a labor of love, right? And wanting to see people survive this thing. I keep saying that I'm just hoping to see all my friends and my family on the other side of midnight and that we, we can make it through this thing if we hold on tight, if we pay attention to what is right, if we deliver truthful news and information if we follow our gut instincts about what is right, and if we pay attention to the facts, to the scientists, to Dr. Fauci, who's done a brilliant job, and many other doctors, right, and, and, uh, and scientists around the world who've given us some very, very simple protocols to follow. And if we follow those, if we disregard all the fake news, and we pay attention to uh, our basic safety, then we can survive this. Mayor, I wanna thank you so much. You are absolutely brilliant. It's wonderful to hear you speak and I really look forward to meeting you in person when we get to the other side of midnight. But this city of Atlanta should be very proud to have a woman like you standing at the helm. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. And I, I appreciate your sharing your talent uh, to make sure that people are safe and look forward to connecting you with mayors throughout the country, because what you are doing is exactly what we need and our communities need it uh, most importantly. So thank you. Thank you.